Interracial marriage is currently skyrocketing in the Western world, and although they don't really keep statistics on the subject, in most other parts of the world the practice is increasing as well, although still rather taboo in most cultures. It's becoming increasingly common to see people from different ethnic, racial, or even religious backgrounds in committed relationships in the United States, especially in my state, Texas, and although it is still largely in the minority pretty much everywhere, we could very well predict what the world will look like when every last person on the planet has a homogenous genetic admixture. Now, I'm not directly supporting this concept of mass miscegenation in this video. Every single race of human beings is uniquely captivating in their own right and very much worth learning about in order to better understand their cultures and gain respect for people groups we didn't know about much before. Different races of humans have different physiological traits, and it's important to acknowledge this, especially seeing how a future worldwide monorace would be a combination of the mean of all these traits, with some being more visible and others being completely washed out. Now, is this scenario definitively an inevitability for our planet? Clearly not. The human species has diverged in the past into many different groups, as can be seen in this chart I made, cataloging the evolution of Homo sapiens into separate races, starting with Sub-Saharan Africans on the left, and it's entirely possible that new mutations and adaptations in certain sections of the human genome could arise in the future, such as the evolution of blue eyes, which actually didn't exist 10,000 years ago, yet now has affected over 5% of the current human population. This will make itself exceptionally clear in the coming years, considering that the process of natural selection has more or less been completely taken out of the equation for human evolution, so maybe the humans of the future will have traits and appearances, the likes of which we would find completely alien. One of the primary factors in the surge of interracial marriages as of late has been the acceleration of international migration in recent years. However, these patterns of migration are largely predictable and very lopsided in many ways due to a variety of factors. Now, generally speaking, males have always had a much higher rate of emigration than women for almost every society, even going back thousands of years. Now, I bring this up because we currently have many societies on our planet with severe gender imbalances, as can be seen in this map, showing countries with more males in red and more females in green. There is without a doubt a certain band or belt that stretches across the continents of Africa and Asia that contains almost every country in the world with more males, and contrary to what you might be thinking, this is largely a coincidence, with there being many different reasons that the Islamic world, South Asia, and China all have more males than females. Essentially, all other factors not considered, we would see a general push away from this red region into the green regions, and from what we've seen in international migration patterns so far, people are following this pattern. People are moving in large numbers from North Africa and the Middle East into Europe at an unprecedented rate, and I know people have their opinions about that, along with parts of Sub-Saharan Africa to a lesser extent, and people are also moving in massive waves of migrants from East and South Asia to Southeast Asia, which already has well-established communities of both, and also further down South to Oceania, especially Australia and New Zealand. East and South Asians will also be heading to Sub-Saharan Africa in large numbers, most likely in the tens of millions. This can currently be seen in the small but rapidly growing growing Asian communities of Southern and East Africa. Another huge factor in the way of international migration is population density, with countries with higher populations and higher population densities moving to countries with lower population densities, and coincidentally, the map of population density largely aligns with the previous migration patterns we mentioned earlier, however, population densities are changing rapidly, with countries in West, Central and East Africa all growing exponentially and will soon become some of the world's most densely populated areas. The biggest factor in historic patterns of human migration had always been natural boundaries. However, seeing how almost every single country in the world has a functioning highway and airport system, this isn't really a major obstacle anymore, and the only thing stopping someone from settling in another region would be national laws or financial limitations. We can get a good idea for what the average human being for each region of the world would look like by averaging their total gene pool. For instance, in Hispanic American countries from both North and South America, if we were to take every single person and divide by their most basic racial makeup, the gene pool would look something like this, with European and Native American DNA being predominant, seeing how mestizos, Europeans and Native Americans, are the dominant racial groups in Hispanic America. By doing the same for both Brazil and the Guyanas, we would see a bit higher European contribution and a much higher African makeup, while Native American DNA decreases significantly. 
If we were to break down Canada and the United States, the gene pool would be over three-fourths European in origin, 9% African, 5% Native American, and smaller percentages for other groups. This would mean that if the United States were to become entirely mixed with an even racial makeup for every single citizen, Americans would still look overwhelmingly European, as can be seen in Costa Ricans, who are also around 75% European on average. This will probably change in the future as more mestizos of mixed European and Native American DNA and more East Asians come pouring into the United States, but by the turn of this century, the American gene pool will still be over two-thirds European. However, further past this point is difficult to predict, but it can be expected that if the makeup of the planet were to become entirely homogenous, then migration from Asia and Africa would have to massively increase, especially considering how much their populations dwarf that of the Americas. A good example of complete demographic overhaul of a country in a short period would be the Central American country of Belize, which used to be a British territory and had an Afro-Caribbean majority up until the 1950s, very similar to the nations of Jamaica, Trinidad, and the Bahamas, speaking Caribbean English and having a dominant Afro-Caribbean culture. Belize was always a relatively small nation when it came to population, and when they opened up their doors to migration from neighboring Latin American countries such as Mexico, Guatemala, and El Salvador, it was only a matter of decades before the previous black majority was outnumbered by mestizos from other parts of Central America. The genetic makeup of the country of Belize as a whole was completely changed by immigration from their much larger neighbors that had populations of different races, cultures, and religions, with more Belizeans speaking Spanish as a first language than English now. I imagine mass migration to the Western world will be much the same way initially, with new immigrants from Africa and Asia beginning to outnumber the people that had already lived there over the course of decades, or more likely centuries, and once the regions of Africa and Asia have been stabilized, there'll be a migration of people from the Western world back into these countries, creating a more homogenous population, although whether the DNA from certain groups will ever be completely evenly spread out seems improbable, as people with certain traits will always naturally tend to congregate together. By taking the genetic admixture of the entire planet, we can get a good idea of what the future world mono race would look like with the combined genetic input in 2017 for every single country being 20% European, 10% Middle Eastern, 30% East or Southeast Asian, 20% South Asian, 3% Native American, 15% African, and 0.7% Oceanian. However, this doesn't really convey the correct picture, seeing how some regions of the planet are growing much faster than others, and by the year 2100, the gene pool will look more like this, with the European and East Asian proportions dropping dramatically, and the African proportion doubling in this period, and all other groups remaining stable. This is in stark contrast to the gene pool in 1950, only 150 years earlier, where Europeans were nearly a third of the gene pool and Africans were only 8%. The world population will stabilize around the year 2100, so if the populations were to converge at this point, the average human would be around 30% African, 27% European or Middle Eastern, 21% South Asian, 19% East or Southeast Asian, and 2% Native American, which will certainly be an interesting conglomerate. And if you know anyone that's one-fourth white, black, Asian, and Indian, which is unlikely, they'd look like what the average human will whenever the human populations converge. There will no doubt be aversion and resistance to these massive changes to the planet yet to come, with detractors coming from every country, culture, and people group. The thing is though, I do understand why people are against these kinds of massive changes to their countries. I understand why people would want to retain their language, culture, and yes, even appearance of that of their ancestors and be opposed to a complete overhaul of their population. I recognize why people would want themselves or their children to marry someone from the same country or background, and I'm not going to pretend that having one world culture or race will be an undeniably altogether positive change for humanity, as many different aspects of humanity that makes us unique will be lost forever. And I say this as someone with very divergent ancestry from pretty much everywhere on the planet. Whether or not humanity will ever be completely homogenous in appearance, language, and culture is unknown, but it would be very interesting to see what the world would look like if our planet dissolved national borders and the ramifications and probable chaos that would take hold in pretty much every country. What I can say is that in the meantime, we can learn to appreciate the differences in human beings from what we can observe now, do our best to stomp out all forms of racism and discrimination, and never stop learning about what makes us unique. 
Be sure to let me know your thoughts on a hypothetical global mono race or mono culture and whether you think it would be a utopia or dystopia. And by the way, a quick PSA about the comments of my videos. I will say that my comment section does honestly bring me a lot of anxiety to look at, but because I don't believe in censorship, I'm not going to start banning people or deleting comments, but I'm going to ask that you please be respectful of other people, because you don't know just how much those words on a screen can make other people feel. I can only imagine how many people have wanted to participate in the comment section, but have taken a look at how divisive it is, and felt like they had no place in this community of history, anthropology, and culture. Again, I'll leave it up to my audience to understand where I'm coming from and be mature about it. If you see some claim you disagree with, even if it makes you really mad, respond calmly without using any racial insults. Well, preferably not any insults, but this is the internet and I do understand the need for people to have an outlet to blow off some steam. The comment section is definitely people's number one complaint with this channel, other than maybe my frequent mispronunciations. As always, thank you so much for watching. You guys are awesome, and have given me a career I never could have dreamed of. This has been Mason, and I'll see you next time.